Thank you, Dr. Bulbul. Uh, I'll just move to a talk by Dr. Ahmed Shiger on updates on the Arab Journal of Urology. It's a quick update. Uh, Professor Chairman, I'm going to give an update in five minutes about the, uh, the, the current performance of the Arab Journal of Urology. It was uh, the Arab Journal of Urology was founded by uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Fouad Sukaria from Lebanon in 2003. Dr. Sukaria passed away uh, in uh, 2021 uh, due to complications of COVID-19. May his soul rest in peace and Allah bestows his mercy upon him. The first editor-in-chief was Dr. Suleiman Merja from Lebanon, and the first executive board, in addition to Dr. Sukaria and Dr. Merja, included Professor Ismail Shukri from Egypt and Professor Raja Khawli from Lebanon. In the year 2010, this is a turning point in the history of uh, Arab Journal of Urology, and uh, we assigned, there is a new cover, new publisher, Elsevier, new editorial board, and a new set of reviewers and the new policy of... Uh, uh, in uh, year 2019, we assigned the two co-editors, Dr. Adil Bakri from Egypt and Dr. Muhammad Abu Faraj from Jordan. Dr. Abu Faraj is a very active co-editor and he caused a dramatic improvement in the performance of the journal and I do thank him very much. The rejection rate in currently is 86% and the acceptance rate is 14%. The number of downloads is dramatically improving and it reaches uh, to more than 350,000 in 2022. Most downloads are coming from United States, China, India, and the European countries and the number of scopa citation is dramatically improvement year by year. And if we take year 2017 as a reference standard and compare the current uh, citation, we will observe about a fourfold increase in the number of citations. And the percentage of self-citation dramatically dropped from 20% in 2014 to currently less than 0.5%. Uh, AGO is indexed in most of the prestigious sites, and the most important of which is the Clarivet or the Web of Science. AGO was indexed last year in the Web of Science. Uh, the site score by Scopus is dramatically improvement, and it reaches to 5.1 Q1 Scopus in 2021, and currently it is 3.7 Q2 by Scopus. Uh, the current uh, impact factor of AGU, the two-year impact factor is 1.5, and the five-year impact factor is 2.3. The average publication speed from submission to first decision, five days, from submission to first post-review decision, 32 days, and from acceptance to online publication is only 10 days. We have a new policy to publish special issues. This has caused a dramatic improvement in the number of citations. And in years to 2018 and 2021, we published two special issues in the field of andrology. The guest editor, chief guest editor was Professor Ashok Agrawal from Cleveland. And uh, uh, our dear colleagues and friends, Professor Dr. Muhammad Arafat, Dr. Ahmad al Majzoub, and Dr. Haitham al Bardisi were the guest co editors, and we do thank them too much. We established an MOU between the Arab Association of Urology and the Global Andrology Forum, led by Ashok Agrawal. And we got an agreement to publish a special issue on the controversies of male infertility in July 2025. We also established an agreement to publish a new special issue in, on the urology, in the urology in July 2024. And the guest editor will be Professor Dr. Ahmed Nahas from Egypt, Dr. Soumani from UK, Dr. Evangelos from Greece, and Dr. Ahmed Harraz from Kuwait. Regarding the future, we keep an eye on the number of citations and impact factor 
of the Arab Journal of Urology by evolving new ideas to improve the quality and of the published articles. We urge local Arab urological associations to include the Arab Journal of Urology among the journals accredited for promotion of university staff of Arab universities, and we urge Arab countries to submit more manuscripts to the Arab Journal of Urology. The Arab Journal of Urology was awarded a prize from the Elsevier as the most prestigious medical journal among the Egyptian portfolios hosted by the Egyptian Academy of Science. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Now we are starting the session four, the Indo-Euro-Oncology -Euro session two. May I ask Dr. Abu Bakr, Abu Shanaf, and Dr. Khalid al rumahi to, to, to the stage, please. Our first speaker in this session will have uh, Professor Mohammed Bulbul from Beirut, uh, BCG failure in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer operation. Uh, professor Bulbul is a professor of surgery and division of urology at the American University of Beirut. He is diplomat of the American Board of Urology and a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons Johnson. Canada. Past head of the Division of Urology in AUBMC. Presently, he chairs the Scientific Committee, Lebanese uh, Urological Dr. Society, no, 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 a member Dr. of Dr. AAU Dr. Scientific Dr. Committee, and a panel member of APCCC. Okay, the, the, they gave me a big assignment uh, in this meeting. So, today we're going to talk about the management of, uh, uh, mostly the surgical management of non muscle invasive bladder cancer who fail BCG. Uh, there, there'll be going to be some uh, overlap between this talk and Dr. Abu Farish's talk to follow, so bear with us, uh, that's fine. Well, uh, a global can in 2020 classified bladder cancer as the 10th most common cancer worldwide, affecting uh, over half a million people and causing over 200,000 deaths. Bladder cancer is approximately four times common in men, as you know, and uh, it's the sixth most common cause of cancer uh, in men and the ninth uh, uh, leading co uh, cause of death. I don't need to tell this uh, uh, group that it is diagnosed uh, usually at an early stage. Only around 5% to present with upfront metastatic disease because they present with hematuria. Approximately 75% of, of the patients with uh, non -muscle are non-muscle invasive bladder cancer that we classify them into TA, TIS, and T1 disease. These will recur, and they will recur and can progress. This is the whole center theme of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer recurrence and progression. We like to classify these categories, and but we're interested mostly in basically the high-risk category, which are the TA high-grade disease, multifocal, the T1 high-grade disease, the T1 with uh, variant histology, or extensive local recurrence, even low-grade disease, that they never stop coming. They behave as high-grade, really. And uh, what are the man management options? Are usually intravesical therapy or immediate surgery. There are very few, very few, if any, randomized clinical trials that are comparing these. There's now a Bravo study, which is a, it's a feasibility study, really evaluating radical cystectomy against intravesical therapy uh, uh, for high-risk uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and will await some results. BCG. BCG, is it, what's the indi indications? These are the indications. CIS, T high-grade, T1, multifocal, fast recurrence, uh, uh, completely resected primal tumor, it's important. Patients who can tolerate BCG and a normal bladder function. It's really, uh, what does it do? It reduces recurrences and reduces the risk of progression. Also, the mechanism is really not ad adequately very well known. It, there's a strong cellular immune reaction that will happen, starting by adherence of the microbacteria, subsequent cytokines. And Alvo Morales, back in 1976, designed the, the, the protocol of once weekly, six consecutive weeks. The story is beautiful. We'll tell it some other time why he chose this protocol. It continues to be, up till now, the most common regimen we use. What are the facts about intravesical BCG? It works, really. It has stood the test of time, and it works. And maintenance protocols in selected patients are important. However, I wish they cure. They don't. Maintenance protocols are many. 
You can go from 12 weeks to three years, depending on a certain protocol you. The most popular is the SWOG one, that will, uh, uh, you know, the 3, 6, 12, 18, if they tolerate and if they can uh, uh, take it. And these are guidelines for this, for intermediate or for high-risk patients that you know of. We need to know the, the definitions, BCG resistant, they don't respond by three, they respond by six. BCG refractory, they never respond. BCG relapsing, they initially respond, then they recur. And intolerant, they cannot have it and may develop uh, BCGosis. Now we have, we are really at, at a dilemma when you get this. How to best manage treatment decisions for BCG resistant or recurrent disease? The stakes are high. Why? Because conservative management in the face of biologically aggressive disease might result in death from the disease. And radical cystectomy for non-invasive, non-very aggressive could be a surgical overkill. So you have to make that decision. When that patient fails, what should I do? Should I take him to surgery or do something else? And this is where you uh, 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 need to make the decision. What are the options if they fail? You can repeat the UR and see what happens in elderly patient maybe, or low dose BCG interferon, or use other agents, or uh, go to radical cystectomy, or maybe use now systemic uh, uh, treatment. I will go very fast with those, low dose BCG and interferon. Not, we don't use it very much, but it is there, some data, some response. Other intravesical therapy when they fail, we have metomycin, we have uh, one different ways of delivering that treatment by using electromotive therapies. You, have, you can use gemcitabine, gemcitabine as a single agent, or you can combine it with something else. You can use valerubicin if you have it, taxotere, or you do sequential therapy with uh, gemcitabine, taxotere. There are options. You just have to, you see, it's like medical oncology. You like to play with all these medications they have. These are the available uh, uh, medications uh, you can have if they fail, you can try on them, depending on your assessment. Like somebody who has extensive T1 high-grade disease, carcinoma in situ, lymphovascular, as we will see, maybe you should go directly to cystectomy. Sequential therapy, gemcitabine and taxotere, there's a protocol for it, you can look at it. Device-assisted uh, chemotherapy, again, it is just basically to better introduce that medication into the the, uh, uh, the bladder. The new kid on the block is nadofaragine, feradenovac, instilidin, instilidin. It's a non replicating ad adenovirus vector harboring the human interferon alpha 2b gene. You inject a single monthly of 75 and you repeat it at 3, 6, and 9. And there were results reported. If you have it, we have no experience with it, we have not used it, but it is there uh, uh, to, for you to consider. Checkpoint inhibitors, also there now for failures of BCG. And the immune, the, the, the uh, 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 keynote uh, uh, study, the uh, 57, had shown that some selected patients who are BCG failure were not interested in cystectomy and who fail maybe other, or other intravesical agents, you might want to try Pembro on them. And there is more now systemic Pembro uh, uh, the core study investigating combination of uh, PAMBRO plus an uh, oncolytic adenovirus. Uh, the results are very encouraging as well. How about cystectomy? So you have that patient, he failed BCG, is across from your office, you need to make a decision. And you need to make a, a really very informative decision. Uh, uh, taking his bladder out is not a simple decision, but it might be the right one. Upfront the cystectomy, it could be done up front, right up front. You have a patient who, is, uh, who, who comes to you with high-grade non-muscle invasive extensive disease, maybe you, uh, and he had failed the nipple therapy, you want to take it out. Or you can have it if, after, if he relapsed after that, or uh, after they have used other uh, uh, intravesical agent. Uh, upfront cystectomy, uh, the parameters are, if you want to go ahead and right up front, do a cystectomy. Professor have, Bulbul, yes. almost we finish with time, yes. so okay. you can conclude. So I will finish in one minute. So if you have persistent high-grade high, 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 uh, disease, lymphovascular invasion, prostatic involvement, 
prosthetic urethral involvement, variant histology, or the patient is bladder crippled. Triple. An upfront cystectomy has advantages. The morbidity and mortality is low, and the need for adjuvant therapy is very little, and the need for lymph node involvement is also little because you still done muscle invasive disease. So we have a favorable scenario. Many, many uh, 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 studies are, are there. After BCG failure as well, these are the indications. Delayed cystectomy has disadvantages. Of the, 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 the upfront cystectomy uh, advantages and outcomes have much better than uh, uh, delayed cystectomy. So in conclusion, Managing of high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer depends on many things. And it is a difficult, it's one of the most difficult decisions you will make. Non-muscle, non, non, low-grade disease, easy. Muscle invasive disease, relatively easy. This is the difficult decision you need to make, depending on the disease status, patient's medical status, expectations and preferences, commitment to follow up, and availability of resources. And always remember, the easy decision is not always the proper one. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bulbul. And we'll keep a question till the end. We proceed to the next session now for uh, non-operative options and BCG failure and non-muscle invasive. Uh, will be presented by Dr. Mohammed Abu Faraj. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Abu Faraj is Associated Professor of Urology at University of Jordan and his uh, main interest in clinical outcome and biomarkers. As Dr. Uh, Ahmed Shukair presented earlier, he's uh, Arab Journal of Urology co-editor, and he's active uh, reviewer in more than 15 internationally urology and oncology journals. Tafadal, Dr. Assalamu Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure to be in Kuwait, and it's nice also to talk after Professor uh, Bulbul. Actually, our uh, talks are really overlapping. So I'm going to talk about, uh, my job is to talk about novel and operative options in PCG failure. And I think the title is inaccurate. What's correct to say, I believe, is <coughs> novel and operative options in patients with PCG unresponsive disease. Because once there is a PCG failure, the treatment is clear. It's radical cystectomy. You don't have a lot of novel options, okay? Maybe prime modality treatment or something. But we're going to touch base with this um, um, definition in a minute. So let's begin. My name is Mohammed Abu Faraj, and I have no conflict of interest to declare because we're going to talk about some novel treatments. So um, uh, this quick recap, already Dr. Bulbul talked about it. TA and T1, they are non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Most common case of bladder cancer, they are heterogeneous group of disease. We can't, one size fit all doesn't work here. So we have to risk stratify them. All major urological society, they have their own risk stratification system. And this is the definition of high risk according to the American and the European Association of Urology. We have to know that the European Association of Urology, they have the very high risky group. Okay, why high risk uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is important? Because this disease has poor prognosis. Patient with T1 high grade has a poor prognosis as patient with PSA of 75 with a Gleason 10 in a 12 out of 12, uh, in a 12, out of a 12 uh, positive core. So we have to treat this patient. What's the treatment of this patient? Complete TURPT with adjuvant intravesical immunotherapy, BCG. And you can see this is the, the evolving landscape of intravesical therapy. And they have to stop here in the Morales, 1976. And Dr. Bulbur, he, he, he pointed to an interesting point in history, always history, like tell us the future. Why we give sex? People always say, simply because the manufacturer, they provided him with six ampoules. This is the answer for Dr. Bulbur's question. OK? So the standard of care, high risk and muscle invasive bladder cancer is adjuvant PCG after complete TUR. And Despite this treatment, the five-year progression risk is from five to 10. And you can see here the European data tend to overinflate the risk of progression. Similarly, in patients with a very high risk group, the progression rate in 10 years is from 15 to 40%. Now, once the disease progresses from non-muscle invasive bladder cancer to muscle invasive bladder cancer, the prognosis is worse as compared with de novo bladder cancer. So we are dealing with a dangerous disease. And we have an unmet need, because once the disease is progressing, you are losing the patient. So regarding, let's go back to the title. Let's talk about the definition. What, what can we say when PCG is unsuccessful? 
If you face a, a muscle invasive disease, this is BCG failure, end of the story. But if you detect a high risk disease during the first three to six months of a treatment, this is BCG refractory. If you detect a high risk disease after completion of a treatment, this is BCG relapsing. You see it's different, therefore, and to solve this dilemma, the FDA has made a certain terminology and a certain definition for BCG unresponsive disease. It's persistent or recurrent CIS within one year, or persistent or recurrent high-grade disease with no CIS in six, CIS in, in six months, or T1 high-grade at the first three months after adequate BCG therapy. And the adequate BCG therapy has definition, five out of six cycles of the induction and two out of three in the maintenance, or five out of six in the first induction and two out of six in the second induction. So we are agree now on the definition. We're going to use the BCG unresponsive. The standard of care of BCG unresponsive is upfront radical cystectomy. Dr. Bulbul talked about delayed, what I call delayed cystectomy, because once it's progressive, it's done. But if you are doing it while the disease is still in the bladder, in the superficial layer, it's upfront cystectomy. Now, the only three FDA-approved medication in this disease state are IV vulnerabilisine, this was approved in 1998. It's underutilized because of the perceived lack of, of, of efficacy, efficacy. It's like less than 18% and high toxicity rate. In 2020, pemtrilizumab was approved, IV, and nadofaragine viradovic was approved one year ago. This is how I can group the novel treatments that I'm going to go over them quickly. Now, the BD1 uh, uh, pathway has been associated with the progression and recurrence, and it's associated with the tumor resistance following BCG. So, from bench to bench side, several studies result in the approval of the IV pemprilizumab in this disease state. And this is the Keynote 057. One of this arm resulted in the approval of this medication. The, during three years of follow-up, the three-month complete response rate was 40%, and the progression-free survival was 80%. Have they tried intravesical pemprilizumab, Ketruda? Yes, in a phase one uh, trial to assist the safety. This trial was terminated prematurely due to COVID pandemic, okay? Bottom line, this, this medication was safe, a promising result. It's expressed in urine, but not in the blood. Atezolizumab, it's always this drug is unlucky as compared to the impulizumab. This study, the, the, the investigator failed to meet the null hypothesis of the investigator, and they reported a complete response rate of 27% uh, 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 in six months. Atezolizumab has been also been under study in BCG naive uh, patients. Now, another immune therapeutic agent, uh, Infanzi and uh, Vicinium. Vicinium is Octorizumab monotox. This is a targeting anti ebicam It's taken from Pseudomonas exotoxin. Uh, this drug has proven to be safe, and the phase three trial showed that the results are very promising, like 40% in three months, but has not get uh, FDA approval yet, and they ask for further data and analysis. Now, another, another immunotherapeutic agent, nivolumab and lindrostat, this is to, 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 to potentiate the effect of immunotherapeutic agent. This is important medication, very promising, Anketivia and 803. This is a mutant interleukin-15 super agonist complex, okay? It activates and it uh, helps the natural killer and CD8 cell to proliferate and to put the effect of BCG. So this medication is given to the BCG intravasically. It's associated with extremely high response rate, 70% at any time during two years, okay? This drug um, has received accelerated registration. Nadofaragine viradonofek, this drug also was approved by the FDA one year ago, based on an interesting, uh, uh, let's say, background. Now, interferon alpha is very effective against non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The problem is the short exposure time. It will result in, in short durability of response. So what if we made, Adenovirus vector based gene therapy that would replicate in human urothelium and it will give consistent interferon therapy, and this is the base of it. Results are very encouraging, response rate is 50%, and out of those 50%, they enjoy a, a long time remission. You see, in the case of CIS, carcinoma in situ, it's like 50%. In case of high grade, without CIS, it's 70, and it's durable for 9 to 12 months. Now, we have several combos for intravesical chemotherapy with different protocol, GEMDOSI, tax, <coughs> taxan group intravesical chemotherapy, different protocol. This is a retrospective study, okay? So, in general, these combos are given in different. They can be given alone or with BCG. Um, this trial assessing the efficacy. Electromotive drug administration, they simply we put two electrodes at the lower abdomen. 
and it will help the, uh, 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 the mitomycin to be absorbed and to be taken by the urothelium. Okay? Unfortunately, there are no ongoing trial currently in this uh, aspect. Now, regarding the, um, the other option is hyperthermic. They heat the mitomycin to 42, and they insert it in the bladder, and they circulate it for one hour. Results are also promising. Unfortunately, there are no ongoing trials, at least in the U.S. This is like one minute. This is very important. This drug, I think it's going to get approval in this disease state, erdafinitinib. It's oral fibroblast growth factor kinase inhibitor. The Thor 2 trial is a very interesting trial. One arm has showed extremely good results in patients with high-grade T1TA, not CIS. And this is a list of ongoing trials worldwide. Uh, before that, this is a device, also a novel device. This is semi-permeable silicon um, uh, material that's inserted by Foley and removed by cystoscopy. It released gemcitabine, okay, like 60 percent of the dose during two weeks, as compared with a two-hour when you put a Foley catheter. And this is um, the trials that's currently accruing patient in this disease state. Bottom line, in PCG unresponsive disease, uh, the standard of care is radical cystectomy. The FDA-approved medication currently is pemprilizumab IV, nadofaragine, viradufec, and other potential uh, are the vicinium, optorizumab, erdanipirib, and uh, at, uh, N808. And thank you very much. So now we'll uh, have the questions at the end of the session. And we can may ask uh, Professor Hassan Abu to come to the podium for panel discussion about CA bladder. Uh, Professor Hassan Abu Lainain is uh, the president of the Egyptian Urology Association, and uh, he is a professor of urology in Mansoura Kidney and Nephrology Station. Also, ask Professor Raja Khawli to sit for the panel discussion. And uh, Dr. Muhammad Abu Faraj also can come for the panel discussion, please. Dr. Wissam Ujdid is a consultant urological surgeon based at the Royal Surrey NHS Foundation Trust, a tertiary referral center for both prostate and bladder cancer, and currently highest volume single site robotic prostatectomy unit in UK. Thank you. I'm sorry for my sore throat because I would like to talk a lot because of uh, these troubles. Uh, we have 10 minutes uh, for interactive case discussion about bladder cancer. And as you know, blood cancer problem is a lot of dilemma, <coughs> whatever the stage is. So we have a very good panelist, and uh, I would invite uh, Dr. Raja Khawli to uh, present a case scenario, and then we open the discussion afterward. Dr. Raja, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Raja Khawli from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. It's a patient with uh, superficial bladder cancer, and uh, this is for the panel, uh, and I will act as the moderator in this one. 59-year-old uh, active male, smoker for 30 years, with a history of hypertension evaluated for intermittent gross hematuria for the past three months. And this is when he presented to the urologist. He had stable LUTs in the past few years and had a TURP in 2015. The TUR was done, TUR bladder tumor, on an outside basis and did very well and had three tumors. And the pathology came back as T1G3. So a patient who is relatively young, T1G3, and the urologist, who I know very well, told me he removed everything. All visible tumor is removed. Uh, and he definitely has muscle in the specimen that's not involved. So, regular case. So, Dr. Abu Faraj, and what would you do in this case in terms of the first question? Do you advise re -T -U -R -B -T? You have the, You have the microphone near you. No, on your side, on this side, on the right side. Uh, thank you. Um, as you said, I mean, uh, as per guideline and as per, uh, the, the current practice, any patient with T1 high grade G3 should have a uh, second look to UR in six weeks. Uh, this Would will, you do a RTURBT in this case? Um, even if you say that um, your colleague is, like, you know him, he resected everything, I will st still go. It's not only just to recheck if there is a muscle in the sample, it's also to check a complete resection and other side. So I will stick to the rules, and I will go for six, uh, six weeks. You say yes? Yes. OK. Dr. Abul Anin, yes or no? Yes. Yes. 
Would you like Dr. Khalid to? Yes, I will go definitely for second look because it's T1 and second. I want to make sure. Okay, doctor. It is common practice, as everyone agreed to, but in our department, if it was done by a consultant, the initial one, then we proceed with treatment okay. options. So this, uh, okay, it's common practice, but uh, we know that sometimes this is not done, especially in our part of the world. We felt that the three tumors were removed completely. This urologist did not do that, and the patient uh, went on and got something else. But the guideline statement for everyone here of the American Urological Association and EAU, to, this should be very clear to everyone, that patients who should have restaging TURBT are those who are pursue, pursuing trimodality therapy or bladder preservation. This is an expert opinion. There's no proof, but this is, they should have a complete and re- Second look, re rbt Or if you feel you have an incomplete resection, this is a grade B strength, or high-risk, high-grade T8 tumors, or T1 disease like our patients. So these patients should have a second look to rbt And the panelists were very correct in mentioning this. However, in the past, it used to be those who did not have muscle in the specimen. This was the criteria, but nowadays, this is now routine. Can we apply it? Do the insurers in the Arab world allow that? This is another question, but we should offer it to every patient. There is more cost involved. There's a risk of perforation. These are elderly patients. There's a second anesthesia. So these are the drawbacks. So restaging to your RBT, why? Why is it important? Because 29% which are thought to have early stage disease may be upstaged almost one-third will be upstage, and rate of residual tumor detected on second TURBT are 55 to 76 percent. When muscle is absent in the initial TUR, the rate of residual tumor is 50 percent. So this is very clear. These are from uh, presentation at the EUA this year, 2023, uh, and uh, referencing Wang and Miladi. Again, more progression. If you don't do, if you don't do a RBT, higher risk of progression and poorer disease-free survival. This is all proven. Second question to the panel. Is there a benefit of enhanced? Just imagine he came to you at the first outset, before his TUR. Is there a benefit of using HAL or enhanced cystoscopy using blue light? Dr. Abu Faraj, yes or no? Yes, Dr. Abu. Dr. Abu yes, I would. Um, I mean, uh, image enhancing technology can result in, it can change the game. You can detect unrecognized um, carcinoma in situ, for example, that you cannot see with white light. You can detect more tumors. Yes. Okay. Dr. Abu Lainey? It depends on the facilities that you have. If it is available, it is, we will come to use it. Hmm. Of course, if you have it. If you don't, yes. Yeah, there yes, is a benefit. Do do there no? is a benefit to, to do it. As my colleague suggested, it could be useful to detect CIS, thus making the patient a very high risk and offering him then cystectomy straight away. Well, the answer is yes, but in the guidelines, although it's there, you know, it's still there, um, you know, there are some questions about it because it's not available. Second question, would you instill an immediate dose of intravesical therapy uh, of mitomycin immediately after the first operation. Would you use that? Yes, yes, after his TUR. There were three tumors up to three, two to three centimeters. You, I presented the case, the same case. Uh, yeah. Would I mean, you have used, this guy did not use it. This, uh, for, 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 high, for patients with high risk features, no, we don't give uh, immediate post-operative. But in clinical practice, sometimes we just, we don't deny patients from this option. So I would deny them, actually. Okay, Dr. Abul Single installation therapy after the primary TURBT is still questionable because a lot of papers came from uh, uh, Sweden and from other Scandinavian countries. It didn't do in any, any difference if you inject or not. But uh, sometimes the, for the patient to be more convinced that I do all the best that could be done for this case, but to myself, I didn't use it in the, in the practical life. You will. 
No, for the single installation, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes there is significant lack of these uh, medications in the market. Yes or no? Uh, in my practice, I judge by my eye. If I think this is superficial, not the high risk, like T1 or carcinoma in C2, and I am thinking that I will give the patient most likely BCG, I will not give. If I think it's low malignant potential, I will go for a single installation. The guidelines are about intermediate risk. So this is clearly, if it's three tumors or three centimeters, clearly not an intermediate risk. So I wouldn't use mitomycin single insertion. Well, again, this is, uh, there's a 15 to 20 percent advantage if you give a single dose uh, in several studies. And this is prospective. Now, you can argue that the very high risk, the very high risk, based on the criteria mentioned in the lecture, may not always, but in limited tumor burden now, it's uh, accepted. And uh, in, both in the United States and Europe less because some are not gonna benefit as much as others. Except if the surface area is a lot, again, those may not benefit. But this is something we're losing advantage of. Now, what is used, mitomycin or gemcitabine? I'll tell you now, off the bat, just a piece of information that what is used now in the United States, in the Northeast and Midwest, is one single dose of gemcitabine, two grams and 100 cc's in the recovery room. Because the side effects are much less, less absorption, this is what's used in the United States. So this patient, to go on, he did, uh, uh, he, he, he was advised, but did not have RTURBT, and received five doses of BCG directly, based on the fact that muscle was negative, and they couldn't tolerate the last dose, and he was followed two months later and had polypoid areas on the ultrasound, and the CT scan, um, so the, the cytology was atypia, suspicious, and the CT scan was performed that showed either bladder tumors or clots, and this is the CT scan. Now, maybe you can probably see a little bit. This is the video. Uh, the upper tracts are normal, so there is no reason for this person to recur. It's important to do a good CT urogram. This was done at our institution uh, when he was present. And you can see two filling defects, one actually at the entry of the left ureter, and one on the left anterolateral with one also on the anterior. So three areas of suspicious recurrence four months after. Uh, he did get six weeks, or say five weeks of BCG and then a holiday of four weeks and came back. And you can uh, appreciate that uh, this area is showing the filling defect. So now this patient was advised to uh, undergo uh, a RTUR now and to completely clear him. So the guideline statement mentions that the resection should be complete from the outset and you should really inspect as much as possible for short, small tumors and chart every tumor. Uh, and this was not done in the very initial setting. So he may have been missed with few tumors and had BCG while he's being missed. Uh, also, you, after visualizing everything that's resected, you should also uh, do a double check with everybody, just look at the bladder again and do a chart, because the check chart apparently uh, decreases also progression in 20%, and this was shown at the AUA last meeting. At the AUA as well, the issue of the blue light cystoscopy is a moderate recommendation, not many people have it, as the panel mentioned. And this patient, uh, he did undergo another TURBT uh, and had multiple tumors. And uh, these, one of them was very close to the left ureteral orifice. Uh, and uh, there was no visual tumor left behind. Complete resection, second time. This was at our institution by me. And uh, this is the pathology. If you want, can you see it there? But there was, again, 
um, an area of low-grade TA urothelial tumor at the trigone. The rest show TAG3 and T1G3. No muscularis involvement. So all of these uh, show some tumor and BCG, uh, sorry, and uh, this was after BCG. So prosthetic urethra was negative because I had told the patient we may proceed to cystectomy later on. Um, and the prosthetic urethra was negative. So in this juncture, uh, this uh, patient has several questions I'd like to ask the panel. Do you routinely submit the pathology as I did, like five specimens of every tumor with the base of every tumor? I do. You do. Dr. Hassan? No, I do separate uh, from uh, the different areas of the bladder, and also I have the interest of the supramontanal prosthetic urethral biopsy in on assumption that I would need to stick to me later on, so I have information about uh, non-malignant uh, cut okay. margin. So random biopsies as well? Yes. Okay. Dr. For me, I send them as the superficial and deep, and deep resection, unless if I have from specific areas. Yeah, superficial and deep. This was done here. Some of the deep were also cup biopsies. Would you recommend repeat TURBT in this case? Now, he's visibly very clear. We don't know if he didn't tolerate the last dose. Was that enough BCG? But this guy has had one BCG course, and now he has visibly a clear bladder, but he's a BCG failure. So would you offer directly now a so cystectomy I think it would be reasonable here to, It would be reasonable to proceed with a cystectomy without offering a re r since it's qualified as BCG failure here. So I wouldn't re rb like this will be his third TURBT, so I don't see the benefit. Yeah, you can consider it as a failure, and for T1 high grade, be a cystectomy will be the next step. You can consider. You, you can find it difficult you know, convincing him he's a young patient, and he will lose his bladder very early in his life. But I would think that this bladder is uh, <clears throat> not innocent bladder. It is unstable disease, and it may require for the future. I think you cut it short and try to convince the patient for early cystectomy, which offer him a good diversion, nerve sparing, and I think this is the optimal treatment from my view. I think, I think this is what was the same thing. You try to convince him. Yes, yeah, so we can. You have to offer him upfront cystectomy, and you, can, you have to tell him this is the best, best chance, but it depends where you work. If you can provide him with some of these uh, recent uh, options, well, you can offer him pemtrilizumab, not for those, uh, enroll him in a trial, for example, whatsoever, yeah, but you have to offer him upfront cystectomy. Well, this is exactly what we tried to convince him, and we got the family, everybody involved. Obviously, this was his first URBT at our institution, and we showed him the pathology, and he didn't accept. You know, and this is what Dr. Abu Lanin mentioned, is, a, is the big common dilemma nowadays, the mutual decision-making with the family, especially it applies with the renal masses as well, by the way, is you need to do this because they're small and... This is more serious than the small renal mass, but the decision of the family may not be always the correct one, but they have the right to choose of not going into the, you know, for T1G3. Anyway, this patient received immediate mitomycin in the recovery, and we offered him to continue with mitomycin and then recheck until the time when we can get BCG. We didn't have it before a second course although he didn't tolerate it, and they received five weekly mitomycin. Again, uh, you know, after BCG, like a sequential. This patient underwent a re rbt and it's all negative now. <coughs> Granulometrist reaction, left lateral wall, muscularis present in the third anterior wall, and muscularis propria present and uninvolved in all the other specimens. So this patient had uh, four weeks following mitomycin, and now he is uh, clear. What would be the advice here? Follow up. Nothing. Follow up. But I have realized from the X-ray you showed us there is back pressure on the left ureter. This is quite concerning. I have to follow it up because it may result from cauterization and resection in the area, or it may a new tumor in the area. So I have to 
explain to him that his bladder is under active strict surveillance for shorter time of evaluation. Well, this is exactly, again, my concern, and this is why in this patient, uh, you know, advice is to restage him also in the operating room, nothing less than that, and resect that area again. But uh, I also went further and said, if you go to the second BCG, you know, I prefer to do it and get a CT urogram. So he did get a advice to go for this second BCG because he already, already received only five, five BCGs um, and did tolerate three sessions and couldn't tolerate, became the intolerant, as was mentioned in the lectures, and uh, the examination in the OR uh, was negative. And the question is, with this very high-risk T1 high-grade or variant histology, micropapillary or LVI, lymphovascular invasion, many will go to upfront cystectomy. Some patients refuse, and I think going to newer modalities, especially the sequential mentioned Dr. Abu Faraj, of gemcitabine and docetaxel, just after each other every week for six weeks is becoming more popular. And if you, if you cannot, then you can go to other things. But this was all reviewed also at the AUA by Dr. Kamat, uh, showing uh, that uh, the variants may push you to an early cystectomy. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, there are more slides, but I think we're going to discuss them, uh, you know, they were discussed um, just by the panel. One, uh, Dr. Khawli, I want to make a comment on this um, about this CAMAT data. It's old data. And uh, I know this, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it caught my attention because I published a systematic review about micropapillary thial carcinoma in the, uh, in the European neurology. And I looked deep in the literature about micropapillary. I believe, I mean, our knowledge now is biased by this study. It was like 100 patients, 2006, uh, were heterogeneous, those patients. And uh, we just say that patients with micropapillary go for early cystectomy, I think. There are other newer data that might encourage trying with them with PCG. Having micropapillary doesn't mean always this is, uh, this is mm. also an adverse uh, feature, yes, mm. but doesn't mean it's a stick to me all the time. Just a comment, because this paper is very well cited, and everybody is saying that Kamat paper 2006, micropapillary is a poor disease, you have to go for a stick to me. Okay. Like, uh, let's try to think about it in a neutral way. There is a role for PCG. Such a bladder with uh, this positive history I think I cannot feel safe about the future of this bladder in, in uh, regular follow-up. And at one time, uh, sooner or later, uh, this bladder will, uh, will invite us to take it out. Uh, but I don't know at which stage we will do this surgery. He may lose a good chance of having a nice, clean, radical nerve sparing surgery and offer him an orthotopic new bladder otherwise. But the other issue is, what does the, the, the lifestyle of this bladder after many BCGs and many TURs and, of course, history of tumors? I think this is good, all balance it and explain to the patient in the future. Mm. Uh, any more comments uh, from the panel? Thank you, Professor Raja. We have uh, short of time and we have two more uh, sessions. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much, you very much. the panelists. Thank you. We are on short of time and we have to proceed on and now we have to ask uh, Professor Mohammed Bulwe again to present localized prostate cancer focal therapy, please. So it's prostate time now. We've done kidney, testes, bladder, it's prostate. So, well, as you know, prostate is an important disease. A new case will be diagnosed every 2.4 minutes and a guy will die every 18 minutes. So by the time we finish this talk, few people will have died. So it's an important problem. What's the man we're gonna concentrate today on localized disease and the management. We'll, go, we'll run through some of them and we'll talk. Active surveillance for low risk disease is now is the standard of care. It's amazing how active surveillance has clipped into the uh, uh, urologic profession. We active survey prostate, we active survey uh, uh, renal, testes, and what have you. Radical prostatectomy and total gland therapy continues to be the standard of care for the treatment of localized prostate cancer. 
whether it's radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy, whatever the uh, mode you can deliver in. Focal therapy for selected patients. What are the issues, though, with total gland therapy? Well, it's a major surgery and potential surgical complications, loss of ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, and urinary incontinence. Radiation, the ADT side effects, because we always couple it with it, urinary symptoms and rectal symptoms. So, and you have to understand something, that prostate cancer is becoming a chronic disease. So these patients are gonna suffer the consequences of this thing, treatment for years. So though the introduction of precise surgery, robotic surgery, and, and the improvement in the quality of life, there is still a problem with this. So another therapeutic modality was needed, really to cut down on those, on those uh, side effects. Well, in the management of solid organ cancer, there has been a tremendous shift in treating the whole gland to treating only the tumor to preserve, trying to preserve the function of that uh, uh, organ. Like we do it in breast, they used to do radical uh, uh, mastectomies, now they do lumpectomies, lung, kidneys, what have you. The concept of de-escalation. Prostatectomy, though, is not amenable to partial. This is very important for us, and you all know the technicalities. So, basically, you want to take out this, this the whole, oh, I'm sorry. You want to take out this, uh, 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 this tumor here, this whole prostate, because there's a little tumor in that uh, 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 left peripheral zone. Interesting concept. So focal therapy is usually a general term for a variety of non or minimally invasive techniques that will destroy the tumor, preserving the organ and its function. It's for carefully, carefully selected patients. That's not for everybody. Total gland therapy continues to be the standard of care, but for early prostate cancer in selected patients it is, because it can destroy the disease and preserve the function. Why do we do it now? Why is that what has happened? Because of the better understanding of the disease, excellent imaging, excellent target biopsies, that's what has pushed us to do that. Who are the candidates? Well, what you need to have is a definite lesion on MRI, a discrete lesion that you can target and uh, uh, treat, uh, uh, preserving the other gland with a margin, and uh, he should be accepting uh, uh, salvage surgery and uh, uh, alternative. So focal therapy for prostate cancer is not an alternative active surveillance. It's a form of active, ther active treatment. Patient selection has really moved and evolved over the time. But what you need is a discrete lesion. That, 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 it was, whether it's an intermediate or high-risk patient, each center in the world does that, has their own protocols. But you need to have a discrete lesion. You can do it bilaterally. And it is for the people who don't want surgery or don't want radiation. Or they cannot have both. And it's usually also used as salvage therapy for uh, a, a radiotherapy recurrence, and you know they are gonna recur. So we, we have two ways of doing this focal therapy, either it could be the lesion only or the region. Now, <clears throat> there are many, many uh, uh, data on, on focal therapy. This is the, basically the most famous one uh, uh, from the group using HIFU. And basically the five, the uh, uh, failure-free, survival, metastasis-free survival, cancer-specific survival, were all comparable in a propensity-matched analysis with radical uh, uh, surgery. And these patients had intermediate and high-risk patients. So this table will show you, we know that radical prostate patients are gonna fail. Biochemical recurrence up to 30%. Radiation therapy are gonna fail. Focal therapy is gonna fail as well. But the difference is that you got salvages as well with low morbidity and for the selected patient. So what are the forms of therapy available at this point in time? You can use cryo, you can use HIFU, you can use PDT, laser, the gold nano knife, or irreversible extroporation, which is the technology we have acquired at the American University of Beirut. Uh, use it, you, we have used it on now around 12 patients with uh, uh, localized prostate cancer. What it is, it's basically a non-thermal, that's a crucial. It's not a thermal energy. It's a non-thermal energy where basically you shoot currents between, between, oh, uh, uh, around the tumor to destroy the, the tumor 
by creating irreversible pores in the cell membrane that eventually they will uh, uh, die. It relies on Ohm's law. How does it work? It works, you put small, when you do a biopsy, you stick that needle within the tumor to get the biopsy. What we do here, as you will see, we just stick it around it and shoot carnets in all directions. That's a simplified way of using it. And that, that, that's how it goes. And uh, the nano knife is, uh, you basically sculpt that, that, that. You put needles, you can put three, four, five, or six, depending on the size, with a margin, nice margin. It has a five millimeter margin. And uh, 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 this is the machine. These are the probes, they're expensive. But this is where they shoot, and you, this is how the patient puts. You basically put those, those, those needles around the tumor and uh, uh, shoot the current. It is done as an outpatient. Under general anesthesia, you have to give them severe muscle relaxation because they will shake like crazy. Under curarization, it has to be done. You stick a Foley for a couple of days, and the patient uh, 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 goes home. Advantages, it not, it's, it still treats the tumor only and spares the other tissue around it. It is no heat sink, real-time visualization of everything you're doing at, this, at the time, and it has been used tremendously for metastatic disease in liver and in pancreatic tumors as well. Adverse effect, of course, there are, they're very mild. We have not really, in the 12 patients we have done up till now, we had almost one patient we had to reinsert the Foley for him only. No hematuria, no uh, pains, nothing. They, they go home the same uh, few hours later. <clears throat> there are many, many centers in the world who, do, who, do, who, who does this uh, focal therapy, and uh, over 18,000 patients have been treated. And uh, uh, these are some studies using, uh, uh, denoting the effectiveness of uh, irreversible electroporation used in intermediate or even high-risk patients. We, I think when you start, you're gonna be selective, as long as you have a lesion that you can nicely treat it with a margin without affecting, even close to the apex, people can do it, away a bit from the urethra, just to be careful in selecting those patients. Stryker from, uh, Philip Stryker from Australia is the guy with, with the largest experience, and he, uh, his, the data are quite well. Uh, quite, uh, there is the infield recurrence, if we biopsy them in one year, the infield recurrence around uh, 2.5 or maybe 5%. There's outfield recurrence as well, like, every, uh, like, like anything you deal with localized prostate cancer. I wish all the modalities can cure patients, it does not. So this is the, uh, the infield and the outfield recurrences and apical lesions can be treated as well, and it can be also used for radio recurrent disease. So if you have somebody who is only recurrent locally, PSMA is negative, only localized disease after radiotherapy, it's something to do salvage patients with. And so it is a, another study to, to, to uh, uh, do it. So it's not ideal for the patients who have small glands, previous TERP, multifocal significant disease, or paraurethral lesions. We have an aggressive follow-up. We take an MRI at three months, and hopefully at six, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do biopsies, another MRI at one year, and we'll give you the data as we have it. And this is something here that to show you. This is a guy with a tumor, as you can see it at, uh, 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 you can see it here on, on the PET scan as well. Then these are the, the tumor. We performed on, uh, on actually uh, on February 14 this year. It was our first patient, and this is what you see, a cavity where the tumor is. And the, tumor, the patient is sexually active, he is fine, he is, uh, has no symptoms whatsoever, his PSA has dropped more, really significantly, but we haven't biopsied him yet. So I think we should, I leave you with the, the PROTECT trial, which is, I think, one of the most important trial that has been which identified the course of patients with localized disease who were treated randomly with other surgery, acti monitoring actually, monitoring or radiation therapy. In the final analysis, the median 15-year survivor of all one across the four is 96 to 97 percent. So whatever you do to localized disease, these patients are gonna live. And they if, if they have lots of side effects from their initial total gland therapy, they're gonna be carrying it for the rest of their life. That's why focal therapy is very attractive for the selected patients. 
So if you have patients, we are the only center now probably, I think, in the area that offers focal therapy, and we'll be happy to help you out with you. We have instructions for patients Professor for uh, all these. Yes, I'm we done. And the conclusions, I think quality and organ function preservation is the next level of surgical oncology. If we can cure the disease, but you can uh, destroy the quality of life of patients, it's not does not work. In the management of solid organ tumor, the concept of de-escalation is there. The prostate should not be an exception. And if any forms of focal therapy exist for the selected patients, we have used irreversible electroporation and it has been working very well for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mohammed. We will shift to another subject, which is localized prostate cancer, radiate. We will ask Professor Ihab Abdurrahman. Professor Ihab Abdurrahman is Professor of Radiation Oncology, NCI Cairo University, Head of Radiation Oncology and Nuclear Medicine Department, uh, uh, and Head of Radiotherapy Unit in Nasser Institute of Cancer Center. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, for the invitation. Um, and I'd like to thank the President, uh, Dr. Dulaim Al Hajri, Dr. Hussein Al Anizi, and from the AU, Dr. Adil Al Humayan, and Dr. Yasser Farahat. Thank you very much for the invitation. If somebody can help me with the slides, please. Uh, if you can allow me for a couple of minutes, I'm the only radiation oncologist, so I need, uh, because uh, nobody will speak about radiation except me. So um, in the couple, uh, 10 or 12 minutes coming, I'll try to show you how radiation therapy works for the localized prostate cancer. Um, as a um, uh, conclusion from the ISO, European Society for Surgical Oncology, it's time to accelerate and together against cancer. And if we're going to speak about prostate cancer, there are eight services, eight uh, specialities that are working with cancer uh, prostate, starting with urology, ending up by the radiomics team. And the radiomics team is the um, next coming uh, 20 years of research. Uh, and that's why the ASTRO uh, is uh, spending funding about 35% for the genomic uh, who will relapse. And uh, if we are going to uh, go for the personalized adaptive radiotherapy, which means who will receive what and when. So this is the coming era of choosing uh, the, uh, the options of treatment for prostate cancer patients. And uh, as has been highlighted by Professor Bulber, that uh, the value in oncology is always a balance between quality and cost. And uh, by chemical lapse free survival is uh, what we always search for. Overall survival, uh, there is a lot of uh, salvage therapies, like focal therapies, like hormonal, like uh, anti-androgen and inhibitors, and uh, the cost uh, and the toxicities. Uh, this is, again, the goals. What have uh, happened in the past 20 or 30 years in radiation oncology? Uh, the 10 uh, milestones in radiation oncology uh, is by starting neoadjuvant ADT, and the aim of the ADT neoadjuvantly is to downsize the gland down to an average of 40 milliliter volume, because the bigger the volume, the bigger you're going to jeopardize the rectum and the bladder, which are the organs at risk around the prostate. And uh, whether to those escalate, because we know that the conventional fractionation giving 70 and 35 or 80 and 40, uh, we have a 30% relapse, so can we escalate the dose? Uh, yes, we are escalating the dose, but how? Whether you are increasing the fraction or increasing the fraction size. And you should move to a highly conformal techniques like the volumetric modulated arc therapy or the IGRT. You have to see what you're treating. And if you can see what you're treating, you can see always what you can, you can spare, which is the rectum and the bladder. And image guided is mandatory. Directed spacers did not gain popularity because it's an invasive and some complications. Uh, the whole pelvic radiation in, uh, uh, in the consensus of uh, adding radiotherapy to the lymph nodes and SFBRT and incorporating new imaging, as Professor Bulbul highlighted, which is are moving now to metabolic and functional imaging. We are shifting from anatomical imaging to functional metabolic imaging. The advances is IMRTV mat, GIT complications was a little bit lowered by the spacers and the fiducials. SBRT as allows limited hospital visits and similar outcome, yet there is no single phase three trial and the new neurovascular contouring guidelines would further reduce the sexual dysfunction. So this is the options of radiation therapy uh, external beam. You either use the protons, there's only 120 machine all over the world. Where you use the brachytherapy, there are 3,000 brachytherapy centers. But with the LENAC-based radiation therapy, you have 30,000 linear accelerator. 
So we have to speak about linear guided radiotherapy. And the cyber knife is only one machine, but the Linux based cyber knife, I mean a cyber knife equivalent, is now working and in practice. So these are the IMRT and IGRT machines, and this is how we can sculpture the beam. You can see in the, in the and down in the slide, you can uh, just focus your volume from a, an oval shape, mini oval shape, two mini oval shapes, and a very narrow beam by the MLC, which is inside the head of the uh, linear accelerator, up to 0.3 millimeters. And uh, this is the neurovascular bundle delineation. Five experts from radiologists. Still, there is an inter-observer variation because we are doing our timeline and in, uh, in learning. And the ultra-hypofractionation, whether we can use a higher dose per fraction, more than 500 CGY, we used to use 200 only. The moderate hyperfractionation is around 300 CGY. But the ultra hypo, which have been 15 to 20 percent, adopted in 2013, and now in the early 2020s, it's about 25 percent of patients are going with the ultra hypofractionation. So we moved from 40 fractions in eight weeks to 20 fractions in four weeks, and now you can just give five fractions of a two minute session by SBRT. So why is this? Because from the radiobiology. The prostate cancer is a low alpha beta ratio. It's 1.5. What does this mean? That a higher dose per fraction can be more responsive. And uh, uh, good uh, to know that the bladder and the rectum are in the alpha beta of 3 to 7. So giving a higher dose would kill more prostate cancer cells and spare more rectal and bladder uh, tissues, as shown in the figures now. And what's important about the radiobiology, again, is the activation of the immune response. If you are using more than 600 CGY SBRT, you might activate the immune response by activating the CD8 T cells. So again, highlighted by Professor Bulber, the PROTECT trial, 2023. Patient reported outcomes 12 years, more than 1,600. Prostatectomy had the greatest negative effect on sexual and urinary continence. So we are left with radiation therapy. This is to show you that the bladder moves and the rectum moves uh, and the prostate moves. So that's why we have to IGRT, we have to image what we're using. In the pre-IGRT era, there was a 25% decrement if you do not image your patient on a daily basis. So the evidence is clear and it is there, well known for intermediate risk patients, high dose radiation therapy or radiation plus ADT, in the high risk radiotherapy plus long term ADT, in the low risk patient, still there is no level one evidence for radiotherapy. So the PESMA and MRI, yes, the PESMA allows us to see more a focal uh, prosthetic lesion, and that's why the SPARC trial, which we're going to see in a couple of uh, minutes, uh, is doing um, a dominant intraprosthetic lesion, a higher dose up to 200 centigrade, which is biological effective dose. So the ultra-hypofractionation may be offered for low-risk patients, for intermediate-risk patients, for high-risk patients, no. Yes, we have two trials, but they are only toxicity, uh, profile uh, trials, not yet survival profiles. The four large randomized clinical trials uh, for prostate hyperfractionation EBRT was uh, published 2016-2017, and thank to God that I was uh, one of the co-authors for the first Arab uh, publication uh, using VMAT SIB for the prostate cancer, and we had 100% biological relapse-free survival for three years for intermediate and low risk but it was 50 to 60% only for the high-risk patients because uh, we know that the very high risk is only PSA more than 20 and 1, but the median PSA for these patients was around 90. So this is how we can sculpture the dose. The red uh, hot map is for the high dose, and the uh, yellow is for the lymph nodes. Biochemical reps-free survival, and our results were very uh, much uh, equal to Coplain, which used the same dose, 1728. So this is to, know you, to show you that in 20 years' time, the first patient who received five fractions is near, now in 2021, there is no a single phase three trial for biochemical relapse phase survival. We're still awaiting the results of the SHARP and of the PACE-B trials. But in the HYPO-RT trial, which is uh, adopted by the Italian Association of Radiation Oncologists, they compared the ultra-hypofractionation for conventional, not for the moderately hypofractionated arm. So the ASTRO NCC and the AERO guidelines have included that ultra-hypofractionation is an option, not an alternate, as Professor Bilbil highlighted, in centers, again, with high technology and with high expertise. This is the cyber knife, 200 beams, but allow me to say you that you take from 30 to 45 minutes for treatment. And this is how to, uh, the, those map, which is the same like the external beam, 
Again, the membranous urethra, the prosthetic urethra, and the neurovascular bundle, if visualized, should be monitored. But now, prostate cancer treated with only five two-minute sessions is available, and this is to show you how uh, that we have to image the patient during treatment. This is the, the beam uh, is on the head, but these two gantry moves to do a KV CT scan before each session. This KV CT scan would reposition the patient on daily basis to allow proper adoption of radiation for the patient. So at this point, SBRT plus pelvic elective nodal radiation is not standard of care. Selected patients should be uh, selected, and the concomitant ADT is not yet clear. This is the SPARC trial, as I just showed you in 2020. They are using the PESMA and the high uh, uh, multiparametric MRI to increase the dose to the um, dominant intraprosthetic lesion up to 200, uh, 348 gray uh, compared to 112 only to the prostate, 1.5 percent, 150 percent. And this was only the, to show you that uh, the early GI and GU was in the first weeks. And this is to show you the systematic review for the SBRT. The cyber knife was used before the era of 2016. Afterwards, it was only a LENAC based. So because the LENAC is very fast. In five minutes, you can finish the session. And the cyber knife is 45 minutes. And again, with the using of ENI, uh, elective nodal radiation, there is high GU and GI toxicities and that the biochemical control rates is from 85, five years. In Egypt, we have the, uh, this is our journal of epidemiology, prostate comes sixth, and our NCI experience, we have 220 patients. We used conventional hypofractionation and dose escalation. Most of our patients are high-risk patients, and performance status is one. Nodal radiation is more than 80% of our patients, and the biochemical relapse is around 20%, and uh, the uh, distant metastasis was, again, 12%. And this is to show the rectal toxicity, grade two and three was higher for the hypofractionation, but not more than 15%. And this is disaster metastasis free survival, uh, better for hypofractionation. Hypofractionation again is better for disease free survival, biochemical relapse free survival, and 83% of the hypofractionation are, are alive compared to 67 and 83 for the convention and, and accelerated ones. So to wrap up, the ultra hypofractionated prostate external beam with non-modulated 3D techniques are not recommended. IGRT is universally recommended. It is the current radiotherapy practice in Central of Excellence for localized, advanced, post-operative, and metastatic cancer patients. And recently, the proposed criteria for the PROMIS staging, adopting the PESMA RADS, will be a paramount for personalized radiotherapy. This shows you with the PESMA and how we can use the PESMA RAD. Thank you for your attention, and I hope it was useful. Thank you, Professor Abdul Rahman. Uh, now we shift to the another uh, topic, is localized prostate cancer operate, uh, Professor Ramil Azab. Uh, Professor Al Azab is the uh, president of the Jordanian Association of Urological Surgeons and associate professor at King Abdullah University Hospital uh, in Arabic, and he is, uh, fellow his fellowship is from University of Toronto in Oncourology in, since 2005. Thank you, Dr. Nepras. I put uh, this picture. I was lucky to have this picture, so this is the only picture I have. And whatever you ask me, I will send you the same picture all the time. So um, thank you very much. The most important thing about any talk is the, the message we, we leave. And, and uh, you know, we have a lot of slides and a lot of uh, talks and cares and everything. But as a surgeon, uh, we are uh, evidence-based and we like to to know what shall I do and we like always to have our own decision as well this is uh, this is the, uh, the the discussion all the time guidelines are guidelines rules are rules but on the field you decide by the end of the day and uh, today I will touch on the um, the value of extended uh, lymph node dissection versus limited lymph node dissection in localized prostate cancer. And uh, science have went the whole circle on, on this subject. People were doing, when I was doing residency at the AUB, you know, we were doing only uh, extended pelvic lymph node dissection when we have Gleason 7 or guided by the PSA. And now we are back to almost to the same decision. So um, there was many systemic reviews about this, and one of these it failed to improve that extended lymph node dissection failed 
to improve oncological outcome, including survival. Moreover, uh, uh, randomized uh, clinical trial have failed to show a benefit of extended approach. And this has sparked a, a whole of discussion about this and to, to the extent that uh, patients were randomized. And this is the first time people randomize surgical patients in uh, lymph node dissection. So again, uh, taking this from the previous talk, uh, the uh, imaging in prostate cancer is categorical imaging. I, I don't call it uh, anatomical decision. You want to know if your patient is organ confined, locally advanced, or advanced, uh, metastatic. So is there a value of imaging on, on this subject? And uh, we changed from the combination of CT scan uh, and bone scan to the Bisma uh, PET CT scan uh, imaging just to, to know what are we dealing with, right? So this is the uh, ROC of the uh, um, AUC, sorry, of the uh, Bisma scan uh, in deciding on lymph node dissection, okay? It has a, a high negative predictive value, and men with a lower risk of uh, lymph node in involvement might be clinically useful to reduce the number of useless, unnecessary uh, PLNDs uh, procedure performed. Conversely, in high-risk patients, negative business scan did not do well, and it cannot allow avoiding uh, PLND. So, we are dealing with a categorical imaging, and this categorical imaging is good negative tests. It has good negative predictive value, but a caution should be done in patients with high-risk patients. If the patient is a high-risk patient, uh, then you ignore this imaging and you go ahead and do the extended lymph node dissection. This is the whole message of the, of the talk. Using MRI incorporated nomogram, patient could be spared an extended lymph node dissection if there is risk of node involvement was less than 7%, which would result in missing only 1.5%. So again, we are incorporating different imaging, now MRI uh, nomograms. So uh, whatever you are comfortable uh, with and whatever you, are, uh, you have confidence in, in your uh, radiologist, uh, you should do MRI to avoid unnecessary extended lymph node dissection. Now, I will not repeat a lot of, of these uh, systemic reviews, but in uh, 2021, there was a systemic review and meta-analysis of 27 studies showed that BISMA bit scan has a significantly higher sensitive and negative predictive value, as I mentioned, in lymph node posit positivity in inter intermediate risk versus high risk groups. This suggests that giving a lack of survival benefit of PLND, it might be safely omitted in patients with intermediate or low risk patients. In intermediate risk patients whose staging business scan is negative. Now, uh, this should also use the ISOP the International Society of Europathology uh, uh, in, in addition to this, all right? Now, did extended lymph node dissection have any uh, oncological outcome uh, in intermediate risk prostate cancer patients? There was a multicentric study of the Turkish Oncological Association, and they, uh, they have a decent number of patients and they aimed in to evaluate the effects of uh, pelvic lymph node dissection combined with radical prostatectomy on oncological outcome in the amico intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. And a total of 631 patients were included. And you know, prostate, anything related to prostate has high, high power. You need a lot of patients to prove your points. And um, um, half of the, almost half of the patient had a pelvic lymph node dissection, and 44% uh, had no pelvic no lymph node dissection, and there was no significant difference in mean biochemical failure, uh, recurrence-free survival was found between patients with PLND and no uh, pelvic lymph node dissection.
This is something important, but if you do the sub-analysis, there are some details that we should uh, uh, attend to. And this is again was reciprocated in this another study. So lymph node dissection to do it across the board did not increase the, uh, the oncological outcome. So what shall we do? Do an extended lymph node dissection or not? The EAU guidelines came to say that it strongly recommend extended PLND for all high-risk patients. So we are limiting now uh, this for high-risk patients uh, and for intermediate risk patients for whom the estimated risk of pathological positive lymph node exceeds 5%. There is currently no evidence that lymph adenectomy improves the survival of uh, radical prostatic, uh, prostatectomy patients. Now, so we are now talking about the grade. Now, it's not across the board. And this also was reciprocated in the AUA and NCCN guidelines and the AAU guidelines. It's related to unfavorable intermediate risk and high risk patients. Uh, if you do extended versus limited lymph node dissection on all patients, this is the, uh, there is a slide that did not, this is the positivity of the, of the lymph nodes. So it seems that you don't have to do it in every, everybody. If, you, if all sane surgeons don't like to go to the perisacral uh, uh, veins, right? So it's not necessary. So we keep this only for intermediate and who has lymph node positivity chance of more than 5% and high risk patients. And this is the diagram showing that you, you don't really uh, need to go below the obturator. You don't have to go lateral. You don't have to go to the perisacral uh, region to, to have uh, a good results. And this is the Kaplan Meyer of estimated biochemical recurrence according to limited or extended. And it's all the same in low-grade patients, but when you have high-grade patients or unfavorable patients, ISOP, high-grade patients, there is a difference, but across the board, no. So uh, in conclusion, this RCT confirms that extended uh, PLND provides better pathological staging, better staging, uh, while differences in early oncological outcome were not demonstrated. So it's good to do it when you want to stage your patient to, to, to see what is the extent of your disease and whether you need, for example, ancillary uh, or addition of uh, uh, radiotherapy in these patients. I will not go into this slide, of course. And I will go to the, um, uh, the, the guidelines. What, the, what does the guidelines say? Uh, you have to inform, you know, this is the previous guidelines that recommended that to perform extended lymph node dissection when uh, lymph node dissection is deemed necessary. And they lift it as such. And uh, it, is, uh, it says clearly that you should perform extended uh, pelvic lymph node dissection in intermediate risk uh, if the risk uh, of positive is more than 5%, as I stated. So this is the reiteration of what I said. So the guidelines after all these reviews uh, confirm that it is driven by how the patient's um, uh, uh, disease um, characteristics are. So um, again, and I will not repeat this, and this is this study uh, Dr. was Barbie. done at uh, one minute, yes, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they did, this is the first time they did randomization. 757 uh, patients did extended versus limited. And this is the, uh, the, the map they put. The problem with this study is that some surgeons did not listen to the, as they should, they did not listen to the randomization and they went and, and uh, took more lymph nodes. So there was a crossover. And this is the extended, going below the rectum, below the obturator means extended. And it showed that uh, it's almost the same across the board, but it has better outcome when it's done in an unfavorable prostate cancer. So I will stop here for the sake of time, and thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Rami. And now shift to the last uh, topic in our uh, session. May I ask Dr. Omar Al Hunaidi to come to the to the stage? and also ask Professor Mohammed Musa and Dr. Jonathan Noel. Assalamu alaikum, good evening everybody. Today we will have uh, some cases to moderate about prostate cancer. My name is Dr. Omar al Hanidi. I'm a urologist as well as a uro-oncologist. So first case, these cases are not very uncommon, but sometimes we, ne sometimes we need to get uh, different opinions in terms of treatment. So this is a 68 years old male patient with rheumatoid arthritis. This is, I think, an important thing to, to mention that he's a rheumatoid arthritis patient on Humira. He underwent four thrust biopsies, 2012, 2016, 2018, as well as 2019. First three were negative, last one. First three were negative, last one, 2019 was positive for eight cores, four, on, four Gleason 7, three plus four, as well as four for Gleason 6, as well, so eight out of 12 cores. So he's intermediate risk. Part of staging protocol in Kuwait, we go for uh, PET scans. So he did sodium fluoride PET scan, which showed bony lesions in multiple ribs, as well as the bilateral femoral shaft. He underwent PSMA, which showed avid lesions in the iliac bone, as well as the fifth rib and iliac lymph node. So putting the picture together, his PSA is not high, it's eight, not very high, sorry. And he is having advanced disease, metastatic disease, based on the PSMA, as well as uh, three negative biopsies. And it's intermediate risk, three plus four, not high uh, core involvement. With intermediate risk, but metastatic disease. I mean, uh, this patient is having a PSA of 8.9. 8. Yeah. And uh, um, PET scan PSMA, uh, there are three lesions, as I see. This is considered oligometastatic uh, prostate cancer. And would advise, now we can, uh, if he is, uh, I will advise him to choose between uh, radical prostatectomy, we can do it in three lesions or uh, other modalities. So he had lymph nodes. He has one lymph node, you told me. Yes. It's only one lymph node and one bone, two bone lesions. He has bilateral femoral shaft and uh, in the rib as well. Ah, he multiple had, ribs yeah, and bilateral femoral shaft. Because he did. This is in the pet, uh, and, uh, but see, PSMA, is it more sensitive <laughs> than the NAF? But NAF is more better to detect bony lesions. PSMA more in, in, in organ organ related okay. like liver or. Liver and if we will combine both of them, it is hemostatic disease. We have to go for hormonal treatment and uh, antiandrogens. Okay, he, he the patient went for multiple medical oncologists as well as euro oncologists, and a lot of our two sorry two medical oncologists raised the issue that. Humera might, might be rheumatoid arthritis, and Humera might be the cause of having this false positive findings on the PET scan. Yeah, I've told you the PSA, it's a bit uh, it's low PSA with such a diffuse bone metastasis. It's not, uh, it's not uh, logic. Um, yeah, so he's, by all accounts, looks like he's got metastatic disease. I take your point about a Humera. We would discuss this in a multidisciplinary team meeting with oncology. And usually when we have these conditions where we're not sure whether other factors come to play to cause metastatic disease, we do start them on androgen deprivation therapy and perhaps do another scan, perhaps another PSMA scan, three to six months, see if there's response. That's one way to manage it. Certainly not surgery or local options, not for this patient of rheumatoid arthritis. Any addition from the audience? Histopatho histopathology was reviewed, yeah. and it confirmed the diagnosis, eight cores positive, four were Gleason 7, 3 plus 4, and four were Gleason 6. And as I said, PSMA showed these lesions. Thank you. Uh, I think sometimes this happens uh, when you have non-targeted 
uh, areas that were biopsied, and the target itself, not many biopsied. So the amount of pathology on the prostate specimen is much less than what you would expect with the metastasis. So I think there should be a look at what the Humera can cause or the Please. SUV of the PET PSMA. So now what we're looking at and what's important is how intense was the pickup on the PET PSMA because usually the PET PSMA is more accurate than the NAF, mm -hmm. even for bony metastasis. The beauty of PET PSMA, uh, like the uh, uh, DC pile also, is that you are going to get skeletal metastases and lymph node metastases. So I think the SUV, the amount of intensity, should have been reported maybe. But, but the treatment, I agree, I think this is a systemic treatment. You could consider if he has less than three to five metastases, radiation to the prostate, uh -huh. to the primary. I, but, so, but the systemic, which will include also androgen receptor pathway inhibitors as well as ADP. I mean, what, what, why did we do two PET scans? Normally we do for imaging, we do only one. I can't answer this question, but the Kuwait protocol in the Kuwait Cancer Center, they go with PSME as well as uh, sodium fluoride PET scan. I think it is under some trials, under some trials to, to figure if any of these would be better. I mean, you will be more confused. You will do more imaging, more so, different results, you will be more confused. It, it's, all, it's always different results, to be honest. Uh, NAF usually picks more of bony lesions, so uh, PSMA picks more of like organ-related lesions, less likely to pick bony lesions. I just want to raise one thing, as you said, he had four thrust biopsies, these were negative. And the one was positive in 2019, it was preceded by another biopsy, like, in 2018, it was negative. So, like, I don't think we missed a bit of big lesions. I think it's related to the Humera, but the patient was started on ADT just to give him the benefit of the doubt. Since 2020, he's on ADT. P PSA three months after starting ADT is undetectable. Repeated PET scan in like 14 months showed stable bony lesions on sodium fluoride. PSMA, PET, mild reduction in bony and nodal metastasis. Patient is bothered from the side effects of Zoladex as ADT. So he was thinking of having intermittent. So he stopped Zoladex in July 2021. PSA picked up. So he was afraid despite the assurance from our side as well as the medical oncologist. Any further plan? I mean, Can why did you stop the Soladex? As part of intermittent, uh, intermittent. Uh, ADT. Yeah, yeah. Then you, you have to, to, to go further and to see PSA, how it is developing. And then we, you will add it again. This is the aim of intermittent treatment. Any other? No, no. Just intermittent hormone therapy? If you consider him as intermediate risk, favorable intermediate risk. Non-metastatic. But, did, but didn't his bony lesions respond to ADT? How can you manage him with active surveillance? Do you go to the previous slide? There was some reduction in the PSA. Stable. Stable, nothing. They did not respond. So probably these are not disease or something else, and the bone biopsy would have solved it for you, and you would have treated him as a localized patient, whether with active surveillance or, or any of uh, radiation, even, even surgery. So, patient continued on ADT as he was worried of metastatic disease. Furthermore, we repeated the PET scan in October 2023. There was no osteoblastic lesions suggesting bony metastasis. PSMA showed some persistence and stable mild PSMA expression in the prostate, left external iliac lymph nodes, as well as the fifth rib. Any further comment? This is quite a complex case, so. <laughs> <laughs>
I think he's having castrate resistance. I don't he, know. He's back and his PSA is undetectable still. PSA is undetectable. Still undetectable it's, with progression. There, there is, sorry, there is no... P, no PSA is still undetectable, but with progression, the progression on the nerve pad scan. There is no progression in nerve. Showing no, no osteoblastic. No, no, no osteoblastic. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a comment uh, in that this patient... Why he started? Because he was, like, uh, scared that this is metastatic. Like, just to put the patient between, like, reading more about prostate cancer and, like, reading more about the side effects of ADT, the patient was, uh, like, reluctant. Then he stop stopped first. Then he restarted. This, this, patient represent, this patient represents oligometastatic disease. And this patient has metabolic uptake on PET-PSMA. PET-PSMA does not lie. When you have an uptake in the bone or node, this is metabolic. So it's not like a fracture in a rib or a lymph node. So this patient should be treated like that. It was mentioned by the panelists and this patient should be irradiated to the prostate, and the metastases, when they appear, also if they are oligoprogressive low, you can also do MDT, metastasis-directed therapy, and give him aggressive hormonal continuous ADT plus uh, pathway inhibitor. So this is a patient, it's only the accuracy of the PET at the beginning that made it confusing, but actually the repeat PET is positive, and there was a reduction on the ADT. It's so this is an oligometastatic disease. It cannot be put on active surveillance. It is not like uh, the, the. It's not only the, com the com It's not only the confusion of the PSMA as well as the PET scan. It's the confusion of how come a PSA of eight with three negative biopsies, all of a sudden we get a positive biopsy in a year with a metastatic disease. I that think it was a miss before. It was missed few <laughs> times before the area of fusion biopsy. No, it was a transrectal, not MRI guided. No. Uh, Dr. Omar, your Any idea about Humera radiation, uh, Humera rheumatoid arthritis? And, and I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers in the, in the second in oncology session. May I ask Dr. Hilal Al Rashidi, Dr. Adel Al Hnayan, and Dr. Isam Al Azawi to come to the stage for, as a moderators. Thank you very much.